Our scripture reading for this morning is Psalm 30. I exalt you, Lord, because you pulled me up. You didn't let my enemies celebrate over me. Lord, my God, I cried out to you for help and you healed me. Lord, you brought me up from the grave, brought me back to life from amongst those going down to the pit. You who are faithful to the Lord, sing praises to him, give thanks to his holy name. His anger lasts for only a second, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay all night, but by morning, joy. When I was comfortable, I said, I will never stumble, because it pleased you, Lord, you made me a strong mountain. But then you hid your presence. I was terrified. I cried out to you, Lord. I begged my Lord for mercy. What is to be gained by my spilled blood, by my going down to the pit? Does dust thank you? Does it proclaim your faithfulness? Lord, listen and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You changed my mourning into dancing. You took off my funeral clothes and dressed me up in joy so that my whole being might sing praises to you and never stop. Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I want to give you a little behind the scenes on uh, sermon prep from this last week. Uh, we are drawing to close our Theology of Pop series. And week one, we just had an intro on all of it. And then uh, weeks two and three, Jeremy and I were super confident in our song choices. Uh, for orientation, we did What a Wonderful World. And that was such a great selection because not only did it match the theme and not only did it have an amazing backstory, but it had a deep personal connection for me. Um, and uh, it was just really... Uh, it felt right for, for that week. And then last week, Jeremy took us uh, into disorientation. And who remembers our song from last week? Yesterday, Yesterday by the Beatles. Um, it is very recognizable and beloved. I learned this week that it's the most covered song of all time. Did you know that? Uh, it matched the theme um, of tough but relatable emotions. Isn't it interesting? The most covered song of all time is not some peppy, happy song. How many of you, like, your favorite or one of your top favorite songs is a melancholy song? A song that, like, puts to words and to melody some tough feeling in your life and it brings you comfort. It's kind of crazy how a lot of us have a breakup song somewhere in our past that really meant a lot to us. But what was great, too, what I really loved about it was that it offered a contrast. Right? The message of the, the pop song, the message of kind of pop culture is just, just remember yesterday and wistfully wish we were back in yesterday. But Jeremy reminded us that that's not what the Christian faith is all about. The Christian faith is grounded in hope. The message of the gospel is not just pining for yesterday, but that the hope we have gets us through today and calls us into the future. Well, this week I was looking over Jeremy's recommendations for this final week. We're in the theme of reorientation. And the song that he had down was Mr. Blue Sky by ELO. Anybody here familiar with that song? Yeah. I wasn't either. Some of you were. <laughs> I went to Jeremy. I was like, I'm going to be honest. I don't really know this song. I was born uh, in the 80s, and my parents didn't play me a whole lot of music from the 70s. Or if they did, it wasn't this one. And so I might end up looking for something else. And Jeremy was like, yeah, no, 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 it's okay. It's just a recommendation. And I heard him cuss all the way down the hallway. Like, uh, uh, no, not really. What, what he said was, you know, to be honest, I don't really know it either. But I just know that it has a line that says it stopped raining, and that's what this week is all about. So if you can find something better, go for it. And I was like, well, if you put that much thought into it, I guess I should give it some time. Um, so I went and I pulled up the music video on YouTube. And Sam, can you put up the first picture? This was the cover image for uh, the song. <laughs> I was like, oh, this should be interesting. Uh, and then you can show the next one. It ended up being kind of dark here on the screens. Maybe the folks at home can see it better. The, like the bass player is in a blue satin shirt and then hiding there back in the shadows are like two rock cellos. Um, it is an incredibly... It is a song anchored in the 1970s. You could take that down. If you go and watch this recording, it not only sounds 1970s, it looks 1970s. Uh, Neil, was that you in the background? Were you in ELO at the time? <laughs> 
And uh, my first impression was like, this sounds a lot like the Beatles. Like if we were at a trivia night somewhere, I would get that one wrong if they played a snippet and said, who sang this? I would guess the Beatles. But it's very peppy and it matches the theme. And Jeremy was right. The words are right on for the theme. And I was thinking like it could work. But over the last couple of decades, I, I have worked up this like preacher, public speaker, storytelling spidey sense to whether I know something is really going to work or if it's like missing a piece. And it felt like this was still missing a piece. And so, you know... I realize like there's one more place I can look for meaning with the song, and that's the story behind it or what it gets connected to, like with What a Wonderful World. Part of the backstory of the song and how it's played out in culture is what brought meaning to it. And so I did what all good preachers do. I went to Wikipedia because it's never wrong and it always tells us the truth. And uh, I was reading about the writing of the song, and I was like, oh, this is, this is good. We're going to use this song. And then I hit gold. And I found this new fact about it, and I sent it to Jeremy, and he wrote back, that's perfect, but you're going to have to wait on that one. I'm not going to share it with you right now. So uh, ELO, who knows what ELO stands for? Any 1970s? Yeah. Electric Light Orchestra, right. Yeah, it was founded in 1970 by three guys in England. And here's what I find so hilarious. Felix, you'll feel my pain. They're described as being formed by two multi-instrumentalists and a drummer. <laughs> It's like, there's two very talented musicians and then their friend who hits drums with sticks, right? Like, but their desire was to inject pop music with classical influences. That's why there's rock cellos in the background of that song. Um, although the real funny song, the sound in there goes clang, clang, clang. It sounds like it was a fire extinguisher. They were hitting fire extinguishers in the studio. But um, within two years, one of the two talented musicians left. And so largely from 1972 until today, ELO has been the project of Jeff Lynn. And he, he just surrounds himself with a bunch of hired guns. Jeff largely wrote and arranged all of the songs all by himself. Uh, and when it was time for him to begin writing their seventh album, most bands don't get seven albums unless you're independently wealthy and you just fund your own passion project. When it got time to write his seventh album, he did what we would all do. He rented a Swiss chalet in the Alps. Um, yeah, but when he arrived, it was socked in, it just fog and clouds. He could not see five feet out the windows, and it was dark for a couple of days. Uh, depending on which interview you read, it was either four days or two weeks. I think probably four days was the truth, and two weeks is what it became over time. But for that period of time, he wrote nothing. He just felt empty. There was no inspiration at all. And I think in this, we see some of the themes that we've talked about in this series, orientation and disorientation. Jeff Lynn was obviously an incredibly creative guy. You don't play all kinds of instruments and write six albums worth of music. Back in the day when they were writing like 20 or 30 songs an album, not like seven to 10 done in 35 minutes like today. And this was not a sophomore slump, right? You know all those bands that, like, their first album's amazing because they've had their whole life to write it, and then they can't ever get a second one out. This is the seventh album. He just needed to do it again, just get to work, right? But he couldn't, and that had to be disorienting. Folks like Jeff oftentimes write through process and rhythm. Like, it is their job. It's not that they wait for inspiration, like, if I waited for inspiration, we'd have about four sermons a year. <laughs> but I have to do it every seven days, right? So when you are on a rhythm like this, it just becomes part of it's what you do. But then suddenly, it didn't work anymore, and that had to be disorienting. How many of you recognize this feeling? Something in your life, professional or personal, Something about your rhythm, something about your relationships, something about your routine, maybe something even about your own health and ability. It's rolling along and you take it for granted and then one day it's just suddenly sand in the gears. Or it's gone or it's broken or that peace and familiarity and rhythm you had just evaporates. Week, the week on orientation, we talked about Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, how God created this incredible system of purpose and meaning and abundance and then Suddenly sin and death enter the picture and, and it just all starts to fall apart. Last week, Jeremy shared about the shock and grief of losing his mom way, way too soon. Disorientation hits and it feels like nothing works. 
I mean, I'm sure Jeff Lynn was strumming his guitar and plunking his keyboard and hitting his fire extinguisher and humming melodies and jotting down words. He probably didn't just sit there doing nothing. And surely that's how some of us respond in seasons of disorientation. I just have to keep going. I just have to keep trying. Try harder. I can just work it out. I've done it before. I can do it again. There's a solution out there. I just have to find it. Now, look, I'm never going to knock hard work as long as we're doing hard work responsibly. But how many of you also know that there are certain things in life that more time or more effort don't necessarily lead to a solution? True disorientation is 99% of the time, if not 100% of the time, not something that we can work ourselves out of. It's not a momentary challenge that just needs more knowledge, more skill, more experience, or more tools. It's also unlikely that the way out of disorientation is backward into our original orientation. But how many of us also try that? Let me just go back to the way it was. Let me see if I can figure out how to reclaim what I had before. What we need is reorientation, which is oftentimes a push forward. And it's described in the theological literature we've been using to prepare this series as a surprising gift of new life given by God. It's not a progression, it's a transformation. And so one morning, Jeff Lynn woke up and suddenly all the clouds and all the fog were gone. Mr. Blue Sky had returned. He could see the Alps for miles. And he says... He wrote Mr. Blue Sky and 13 more songs in two weeks. That's an average of one song a day. This surprising gift of creativity just poured forth, but it poured forth in response and after a life-giving change that he had no control over. And when we look at our scripture, we see a much more serious but no less joyous expression of this same thing. Psalm 30 begins, I exalt you, Lord, because you pulled me up. You didn't let my enemies celebrate over me. Lord, my God, I cried out to you for help, and you healed me. Lord, you brought me up from the grave. You brought me back to life from among those who are going down to the pit. So here we see this great reversal of fortune, right? This great transformation. There's the threat of enemies. There's the psalmist crying out for help. There's the psalmist feeling like they're heading down to the grave, and yet, Lord, you pulled me up. Lord, my God, you healed me. Lord, you brought me back to life. God brought him forward. God initiated the move, and it was a move that led into a new kind of life. And the middle of the psalm has echoes of the chorus of Mr. Blue Sky. That chorus, if you're familiar with the Mr. Blue Sky, can you tell me why you hid away for so long? What did we do wrong? How many of you can relate to that when God feels distant? Here's the middle of Psalm 30. You who are faithful to the Lord, sing praises to him, give thanks to his holy name, his anger lasts only for a second, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay all night, but by morning joy. When I was comfortable, I said, I will never stumble. But it's because it pleased you, Lord, that you made me a strong mountain. But then you hid your presence. I was terrified, and I cried out to you, Lord. We see this idea of perhaps some of the psalmist's disorientation came from God being angry. Were God seeming distant or even seeming like God was hiding? Last week's scripture began, God, why have you abandoned us forever? Why does your anger smolder at the sheep of your own pasture? But notice in today's psalm, the psalmist is through this season and on the other side. The psalmist is in the season of new life, and so he has a new perspective on it. Does God get angry sometimes? For sure. But the psalmist isn't dwelling on God's anger or even why it came about. His focus is on God's favor lasting a lifetime. It's almost as if the perspective is, well, yeah, of course this was going to happen. I'm a human. I make mistakes. I sin. And if I sinned, you know, God's going to get angry. And if I were God, I'd probably be angry too. But you know what? I've experienced the favor of God. And this new gift of life I've received makes that season seem like an afterthought. Weeping lasts only for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And you can almost tell that this reorientation is a surprising new thing because he actually reflects back on the original orientation. He says, when I was comfortable, I said, I will never stumble. 
The psalmist had gotten so comfortable in the original orientation that he began to forget where that sense of peace came from. He began to forget where the blessing came from. He began to think that it was his own doing. But now on the other side, he recognizes because it pleased you, Lord, that you made me a strong mountain. And it only became clear to him after a season of disorientation. Without God's presence, without God's provision, that orientation was gone and that comfort turned to terror. Now let's take a moment and be sure we're seeing all of this properly. Because I think it's possible to read Psalm 30 as the psalmist describing one season of their life. And all of these things describe one season. And that's possible. And so maybe his entire season of disorientation did boil down to God being angry or God being distant for a time. But that's not the only way we can actually read and interpret this psalm. And it's certainly not how we can read and interpret all of the seasons of disorientation in the Bible. We can read Psalm 30 as actually a list of different ways we can experience disorientation. Did you notice them? The threat of enemies... The threat of enemies celebrating over us. That's not a disorientation that comes from God or a disorientation that comes from our sin. That's a disorientation that comes from the choices of other people. And how many of you can relate to that? How many of you have struggled or suffered or been through pain or grief because of the choices other people made over which you had no control or input? The psalmist talks of a need for healing. How many of you have ever entered a season of disorientation that came with a sickness, an illness, an injury, a disability that came out of nowhere? He says being brought back to life from among those going down to the pit. And that could mean serious illness or injury. But he also could be referring to the fact that the wages of sin are death. And so maybe he was going through a period of time where he was being influenced and surrounded and joining in with people who were opposed to God or doing things not God's way. And here God would be justified in the anger and disappointment. And then there was also, too, the misattribution of God's blessings, the sense of pride and self-centeredness that I'm making all of these good things happen. And so if we think we're the source of all the good things in our life, when things start to go wrong... We have the temptation to just put it back on ourselves. Well, I just need to try harder. I need to figure it out. Well, if we're following our own way, it shouldn't be surprising that there may be some distance between us and God. So often what looks like punishment in the Bible or what feels like punishment in our own lives, a good bit of the time, that is actually God letting us have our way. You want to trust yourself? You want to make it happen for yourself? Okay, let's try that. I'll back away for a little bit, let you do it. You want to be in the driver's seat? Okay, I'll hop into the passenger seat. I'll still be in the car with you, but yeah, you go ahead and do it. We'll turn the maps off, see if you can get where you're going. It's like the old Dr. Phil thing. How's that working for you? I know the people who work from home and have daytime TV on. And then, of course, when we do stray into sin... And we make intentional choices not to follow God's way. I feel like we should expect God's disappointment and anger. And as much as we want to cut ourselves slack because we might fear the consequences of sin, I think we should all want a God that cares about sin and cares about holiness. And even if that's not what we want... That's the picture we get in the Bible. A God who would come to be with us and to go to and through death in order to remove sin. That God is, of course, going to be disappointed when we choose to give ourselves back over to sin and death. Another biblical narrative that maps orientation, disorientation, reorientation is the book of Job. Job is described as a righteous man. It doesn't mean he never sins and never makes a mistake, but it means that when he does so, he figures it out, he confesses it, he does what's needed to get back in right relationship with God. Well, Job is living this kind of life, but then suddenly he exp experiences immense personal tragedy. And in some weird, twisted way, his friends thought it would be encouraging to say, well, it's obviously because you sinned. You should try that out next time you're trying to comfort a friend, right? And Job is like, uh-uh, no. Uh-uh, look, look I, I know when I sin, and I take care of it. This is not that. And eventually in the book, God pops in and says, yeah, you know, Job is right, and these guys don't know what they're talking about. It can be easy when we're in the middle of the pain of disorientation 
to want to blame God or to blame ourselves. And sometimes we do have sin that we need to confess and repent of and work out. And sometimes we do need to be honest with God about the struggles that we're feeling. But disorientation can come from so many places. How about this? How many of you know that to get stronger, like to build muscle, you have to tear muscle? To break it down, to build it back stronger. How many of you have experienced a season in life in which you are totally comfortable, but God wants something more for you, and you're resistant to that, and so the only way that God can get you out of your comfort zone and into your new thing is maybe by making us a little uncomfortable. The model that Psalm 30 gives us is that no matter what the source of disorientation is, the way through is by seeking God and awaiting this change into new life. So, are you ready for that surprising thing about Mr. Blue Sky? Now, here's where I'm worried. I feel like I built it up too high, and you're going to be not that impressed. And the truth is, the value comes from the preacher turn, so it might seem a little cheesy or bordering on manipulative, but here you go. The first four chords of Mr. Blue Sky are identical to the first four chords of Yesterday by the Beatles. And this isn't GCDC. Like if Rob got up here and played GCDC, we could sing every pop song ever recorded on the radio. These are four really odd chords that should not be grouped together. And now yesterday came out more than a decade before Mr. Blue Sky, so it's possible that Jeff Lynne was doing an homage to the Beatles or that it was just in his head because he'd heard the song before. But for us, it gives us the opportunity to draw this connection, this indelible connection between disorientation and reorientation. Because when you're in the middle of hurting and pain, the thing you want the most is to get out of it and forget about it and get it behind you. And even though reorientation is not about going back to orientation, and it is about getting out of disorientation, they are not disconnected. It is a process. Our psalm ends, you changed my mourning into dancing. You took off my funeral clothes and dressed me up in joy so that my whole being might sing praises to you and never stop. Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. A transformation requires before and after. What the psalmist is finding joy in and what the psalmist is giving thanks forever for is the change from disorientation to reorientation. And you cannot give thanks to that, give thanks for that forever if you completely leave behind and forget about disorientation. Something of the disorientation remains but it's transformed. It makes me think of that famous phrase from Philippians, the peace that passes all understanding. Have you heard that before? The peace that passes all understanding. What does that mean? It means the peace that has no reason to exist. The peace that we cannot figure out. It's when you lose someone close to you and you feel grief but yet somehow you still find a way to feel joy. It's that finding a way to thank God even for the most difficult things in life. It's about finding the way forward when it never seemed like there would be a way forward. It's giving credit to what only God can do. So here's my prayer for you as we wrap this series. We've all got a million layers in our life, and they're all at different points in this cycle. But for the points in your life where you are in the orientation phase, where everything's consistent, everything's running smoothly, everything's going great, there's abundance, there's rhythm, there's routine, please, please, please recognize that this is a gift from God, and it's not something we do for ourselves. Allow it to frame and set our expectations of collaborating with God. For those areas of your life where you're experiencing disorientation, please remember that God is still with you and that the orientation, the good time, was not an illusion. It was real. And if it was real and this area of our life was good, it means it can be good again. 
And disorientation does not have to last forever, no matter what it seems. And for those areas of life where we're heading into or are experiencing reorientation, recognize it as a gift from God. And you can use your gratitude and your joy as an opportunity to demonstrate God's unending favor.